questions about coronavirus. We know that you have them. And today at Nebraska Medicine, we're here to get you some answers. Hi, and thanks for joining us. My name is Kayla Thomas, and I'm here today with Dr. Kelly Cockett. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. We're going to answer some of the most common questions that you've been submitting to us. And you can, of course, continue to submit those live in the box underneath this screen right now. So before we start, this is a live chat. It's for informational purposes only. So if you have any questions about your health or medical condition, you want to direct those towards your doctor. Okay, first, let's start off with the most obvious question. What is COVID-19 and why is it so scary right now? Sure, I think that's a great question and it's such a common question. So COVID-19 refers to the infection caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus that emerged out of Wuhan, China. And this virus is very much akin or like influenza, where the virus is a type of infection that you can get from people coughing or sneezing around you. You can get it from touching surfaces and getting it into your eyes, mouth, or nose. And when that happens, you can get a cold-like or influenza-like infection. This specific coronavirus is new to humans. And so that is part of why there's so much fear. Mm -hmm. One is the unknown of this. And two is it's moving very rapidly. Yeah. So we're seeing spread continually day by day, more and more cases, and unfortunately more and more deaths. So between the fear of the unknown and the speed at which it's infecting other people and making people ill, it's been considered to be very dangerous and very much something that's creating a lot of fear in our community and truly around the globe. You touched on this a little bit, but what are the symptoms? So for most patients, the symptoms can range from actually not having anything. Mm -hmm. So there are known cases of people who have this virus mm -hmm. and they've had no symptoms, but virus has been detected. Mm -hmm. The majority of patients have a syndrome or an illness kind of like a cold yeah. or influenza with cough, fever, shortness of breath. And in the worst cases, our patients get very short of breath and it infects their lungs, causing a viral pneumonia. And those patients may need to be in the hospital mm -hmm. and require more aggressive care, all the way up to life support care with breathing machines. We're learning so much about this so quickly. Yes. What do we know so far about who seems to be most at risk? I think that's also a really good question. Mm -hmm. So we know when you look at the graphs that we have to date about patients who've been sick and infected, and particularly those who have required hospitalization, that it does seem to spare children. Mm -hmm. So particularly those under age nine don't seem to have significant symptoms or maybe asymptomatic altogether. As we go up decade by decade, the older you get, the higher the risk of more severe illness and hospitalization. And it really seems that as you come above age 60 or so, the mortality and hospitalization rates go up even more. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing that in the state of Washington with the nursing home sure. patients who are all much older and unfortunately had high exposures and became sick from this infection. What do we know about how it's transmitted? Because we do know so far that it is very contagious. Correct. And it's contagious much akin, again, to influenza. So if you are around someone who's coughing or sneezing, and approximately within about six feet of them, those droplets that we create when we cough or sneeze unfortunately cause a spray. And that spray, if we breathe it in, if it gets into our eyes, nose, and mouth, that is one way that we can get the infection. Mm -hmm. In addition, we know that that same spray lands on the surfaces around us, mm -hmm. right? And as we touch those surfaces, we can get the virus on our hands, and then we touch our face, our eyes, our, or we're eating, and then the virus gets from our hands to our mouth, eyes or nose and causes the infection. I think that we've all been more aware of that lately, how much yeah. we actually touch our face. Right. It's, it's, it's a habit and people are Absolutely. used to it. So because of this, we're seeing a run on things. Like people like, do I need to wear a mask? Hand sanitizer is right. like flying off the right. shelves. So what are the protective measures people can take that, that actually work? Right, the number one thing you can do is to wash your hands and use hand sanitizer. Again, you know, if you're touching high touch surfaces, a public phone, elevators, if you're out and, you know, touching doorknobs in public, using hand sanitizer again or washing your hands to clean the hands so that the virus gets off your hands so that you don't infect yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, from what I described to you, you can also imagine how the mask really doesn't help you, particularly if you're not washing your hands well enough. Sure. And so wearing a surgical mask is not going to be the best way to protect yourself. In many scenarios, we're actually talking to people about, you know, using those 
hand sanitizer wipes. Wipe down high touch surfaces around you in your workplace if you have common doorknobs or even at home. Good cleaning of your kitchen surfaces, soap and water works, Lysol type wipes that mm -hmm. people are buying work. All of these great hygiene clean surfaces minimize the risk of virus dwelling there so it's not on your hands and you're not infecting yourself. And you also want to make sure to get in between your fingers your nails. Right, absolutely. So you really want to, when you wash your hands or put hand sanitizer in, you want to make sure that both you're scrubbing the surface like this that we always kind of think about and the backside, but you really want to make sure that you get each finger independently and kind of doing that little bit of a nail rub. Mm -hmm you know, getting it in there, and you really want it to be more than 20 seconds. So a lot of people talk about singing happy birthday or the ABCs mm. or something to remind you this is how long it takes to actually do good hand hygiene, whether it's soap and water or hand sanitizer. Mm. Super important. So a lot of people have probably been following the news that we have a clinical trial that we've started here mm -hmm. to learn about treating coronavirus but or COVID-19. So what is being done right now to treat people who do have it? Sure, so again, a really good question. So we do have a trial with remdesivir for patients who are confirmed to have the COVID-19 infection and are in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And those patients will be offered the opportunity to be enrolled in our trial for treatment. It's too early to know if these treatments really work. And so we're not having all of our patients get medication, but really sticking to what we know works, which is unfortunately the fact that we have to do supportive care. There's no drug that we know works to cure the virus or treat it in a way to prevent you from getting it. And we don't have a vaccine, as many people have seen on the news yet, and that's quite some time from being available sure. in the mass public. So we help our patients by treating all of their symptoms, supporting their lungs with oxygen, making sure that they're getting the nutrition they need, the fluid they need, if they have any other infections mm -hmm. that we can treat, treating those as we are able to. How does this compare to the flu? Because flu season happens every year mm -hmm. and, and it's usually very bad. There's a lot of illnesses right. and deaths that happen, but we're kind of used to that. Right. But how does this look compared to that? That's a very good question. So there's two ways to look at it. And I think we have to be very cautious because comparing influenza to this is not necessarily the same. This is an apple and an orange. They're not the same mm -hmm. virus. But that being said, that's a lot of the comparison that we're sure. hearing in the news. So from our general seasonal influenza, it does appear that this infection makes more people ill to the point of death mm -hmm. than influenza in a baseline season. There are, however, very characteristic influenza pandemics that have happened that have had much higher mortality rates that are fairly consistent with what the current estimates are with this infection. So thinking about the 1918 flu, our big flu pandemic in the 1950s tend to be two of the most common pandemics that we mm. refer to when we think about this infection. One of the things that people are curious about is we're expecting to see more cases. We're expecting mm -hmm. to see more community cases across Correct. the country. Should everyone be getting tested? Should everyone be going to the hospital? What, what can we do at this point? Because it, it might get to the point where that's just not realistic. Right, so I think that's a hugely important point. If you have symptoms of a cold, a fever, something that seems like influenza and you're worried about this infection, we actually don't want you to necessarily come unannounced mm -hmm. to your clinic or to the emergency room. Right. Ideally, we would recommend that you call your primary care doctor and ask what to do next. If you are really sick, you're having trouble breathing, you're not feeling well, you're lightheaded, of course, please go be seen, go to the emergency rooms as you would in any other pastime. But the reason we don't want everybody flooding our clinics and emergency rooms is that we don't have the capacity to have everybody there at once. And for every person who's not terribly sick, especially in an emergency room that we're trying to take care of, that also means that our patients who are still having heart attacks, having strokes, yeah. may not have a room to come into. And so we want to make sure we talk to everybody and triage care appropriately, but we want our patients and the public to also recognize that we wanna make sure we provide the right care for everyone in the spectrum of this illness. So again, if you're feeling sick and you're otherwise well enough to stay home, but you're worried about if your illness is a COVID-19 infection, please call your primary care doctor. If you don't have one, call your county health department. They're all looking at how to triage people for appropriate care and screening. 
And I think a good segue here is talking about our workers here and our staff because the community support has been amazing knowing mm -hmm. that we have patients here Correct. who have tested positive from the Diamond Princess Cruise Line. Right. People have been concerned about our healthcare workers or bringing coronavirus into Omaha, but this is an area where we're specially trained to handle mm -hmm. those things. So explain how our workers are able to protect themselves and why this is a secure place and exactly the right place for these people to be. Sure, so for one, we've had extensive experience in training for highly infectious diseases going back all the way to all the patients that we had here with Ebola mm -hmm. we know how to use protective equipment to prevent that spray to get to our eyes into our breathing through our nose or mouth and with gowns and gloves and we have trained for this over and over even when we don't have patients we continue training yeah. Our colleagues who have worked in NITEC have been teaching around the country and really around the globe on how to prepare and how to use that specialized personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. So for one, now is the time that we use that equipment and we know how to do it because we've continued to train. In addition, we have a lot of steps and policies in how we get our staff into appropriate gear mm -hmm. to make sure that they don't accidentally contaminate themselves. We have very clear criteria of how you get into the patient rooms and working through that quarantine, both in the quarantine center and in our biocontainment unit to minimize those risks. We're extremely aggressive about the hand hygiene, even when we still have gloves on, mm -hmm. to make sure that we're trying to get rid of the virus and that we take everything off in a way that doesn't expose anyone. And I think it's important to note, those of us who work here, we see those of you who work with infectious diseases, mm -hmm. who work with our patients, you're looking out for each other too. These are right. moms, these are dads, these are right. daughters, these are sons, and they're taking every precaution and they're looking out for each other. Right, and I think that's very true. I think across the board, our faculty in the biocontainment unit, the quarantine center, the hospital, our clinics, as we're coming together to work through this process, I think everybody is really looking at this as a team sport. How do we help each other? How do we make each other safe? How do we make sure everybody has the training and education that they may need when we start to see cases here, which we, again, think with the spread in the country is likely going to be inevitable. Uh, a question that we're getting on Facebook and that I've heard a lot is about people who maybe have travel plans coming up. There's <laughs> some events being canceled. Yes. Some people are really anxious about the idea of getting on a plane, of getting on a cruise right. ship. What advice would you have there? So I think that is a very common question right now, and it's really hard to answer. Mm -hmm. I think part of it is if your anxiety would be so high traveling that your trip would be ruined, right. consider whether or not you go. There's a lot of evolving recommendations regarding which countries to potentially not travel to if you're going internationally, and the CDC and the WHO have a lot of information in continuous evolvement on that. There, as you mentioned, there are many places where we are seeing large events being canceled mm -hmm. or large gathering centers being closed down temporarily, especially when there's a widespread community outbreak. So I do think you're going to have to, as you approach different travel plans, as we see the U.S. approach spring break, look, yeah. to, look to where you're going, uh -huh. see if there's community outbreaks and see what the what is happening from the state and local government there because it may be that some of your plans are already being canceled by those communities again if they have widespread outbreak if you're traveling to your destination and you decide to travel again i don't think that's unreasonable we're not advising people to not go anywhere and to totally stay home in isolation yet but do think about having hand sanitizer in your carry-on. Think about having antibacterial wipes to wipe down you know, your plane trays, mm -hmm. your tables, to be able to make sure that you have access to hand sanitizer and clean your hands after, again, going through those high-touch areas. And do your best to follow those great examples to keep yourself safe. I know you're busy, so we're going to do a couple more really quick questions sure. that are things that people are searching a lot online. Yeah. Um, what do we know about pregnancy and COVID-19 at this point? Uh -huh. So. Again, another really important question, and I think we're still learning a lot. We have seen some reports that there has been maternal to fetal transmission mm -hmm. early on from China, and that data I think is gonna continue to evolve. I don't think we have all the right answers yet, mm -hmm. but again, we know in those children under age nine, right. the disease doesn't seem to be as severe, so I think that should be reassuring to many of us in that scenario. Absolutely. I don't know that we have as much data as we would like to have for pregnant women other than follow very religiously these ideas of keeping yourself 
you know, with clean hands, cleaning those high touch surfaces, and especially for everybody, if you're sick, please stay home. Uh, people are also curious about humans and animals or pets yeah. and COVID at this point. So what do we know there? Sure, so again, an area where we're seeing evolving information and data coming out, we have seen some reports that there have been dogs that have tested positive for the virus. I don't know that it means that our dogs or pets or other animals are going to be sick, but it means that they may be a vector or a capacity to transmit mm -hmm. infection. So just like we've always said, you know, if you're petting your dog, even if it's your dog at home, you're playing with another animal, wash your hands before and after. Try to, again, to minimize that risk of close contact with animals, especially if you're seeing widespread transmission in your community, because if animals do in fact carry the virus, mm -hmm. they may or may not show any other symptoms. Right now, we live in a social media age. Yes. There's a ton of headlines out there. I think we're getting constant alerts on our phone right mm -hmm. now. What word or what advice would you have to people basically about finding reliable sources and the best information about what we're learning as this continues? Great. So I think it is really important in an era of social media and risk of misinformation to go to very reputable sources. So again, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, the World Health Organization, WHO, for national and global information. Locally, we have our county and state websites that you can go to. And here we have our own website for updates for our local community and our patients on our UNMC websites and Nebraska Medicine websites. Mm -hmm. And for those looking for more information as a healthcare provider, we have some content there that continues to evolve and come forward. And our NETEC colleagues have colleagues have an excellent website with a lot of information and updates about the infection, the data coming out, and that idea of personal protective equipment, sampling, and testing for this infection. Um, one thing that our workers who are working with patients in the mm -hmm. quarantine unit, they are self-monitoring, they're taking their temperatures. Yes. I think it's an important point to wrap up with that people should not go out if they're sick. A lot of us think that our jobs or events or our kids basketball game or whatever can't go on without us. But right. that's so important. Right, especially right now when we know this does seem to be spreading quickly in the communities. Again, much like influenza, which we know is still spreading in our community. So we want you, if you are sick, to stay home until your symptoms are better. Call your primary doctor if you want to discuss what to do and if you need further testing. And again, you know, if you're getting really sick, of course, by all means, please go to the emergency room. If you can, it is always ideal to call ahead, but if you can't, that's okay. Um, but yes, please stay home. Try to protect y yourself from getting infections if you're not feeling well already because you could have potentially have more than one thing you get exposed to, but then stay home and prevent everyone else from getting sick, whether again, it is this COVID-19 infection mm -hmm or influenza, or any other number of viruses we have in the community. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Absolutely. Kelly Crockett. This is a very busy physician right here. <laughs> uh, some of the resources she pointed out on our website, NebraskaMed.com, we are posting daily updates on what mm -hmm. we're learning, and we also have a Q&A there. And as we're getting more questions, we're working on keeping that updated yes. as much as possible. Any final thoughts? No, other than to say, wash your hands, <laughs> stay home if you're sick, and if you need any help, call your primary care provider. I feel like what we need to do to wrap this up is the L bump, which right. apparently is the most popular thing now. So if you're not shaking hands, you're doing the L bump. So yeah, don't shake hands. Please cover your cough, wash <laughs> your hands. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.